All right, I'm back on Facebook Live. Apologies, it's been a couple of months. So what's happened? Well, they just got real busy. So this year I wanted to write my third book and I got way behind on it. But now I've been putting in the work and I'm sort of catching up. And it's today I'll put another good six hours in. It's looking really, really good. The idea of it being to help people, maybe like yourself, literally get in shape when they've been struggling for year upon year upon year. So as a result, there's obviously a bit of the ABCs to do, of course. There's mindset, there's experiments. It's shaping up really nicely. But I've still got to put a lot of work in to get that done on time. Same time, very busy with clients. So right now I've got some people going through some absolutely breathtaking transformations. And you'll see hopefully the results come up soon, you know, as it comes on and goes on. And it's the transformation on the inside, that's the key. Now, the nature of the beast is, you know, on the internet you get these real big... Everyone gets attention when there's like 50, 60 kg loss, four or five stone. But most of my people, they're just trying to lose maybe five, 10, 15 kg, one, two stone. And the changes are no less spectacular because to get the results, he has to do something up here. And I can see, you know, a lot of my clients right now are really making something quite special. Now, what I want to do is try to get it across to you, people at home watching, more about how the whole process works. So I've got a lady now that I'm filming and I'm documenting every single thing that's going on. So hopefully it's going to give you a real good insight. The insight that I want you to see is that getting in shape is not just about not eating this. What exercise should I pick? Should I drink milk or not? It's not about that. I want this filming and documentary of this body transformation this lady is going to do is show you how much more it is, how you can't separate out getting in shape from your lifestyle, how you can't separate it out from your emotions, how you can't separate it out from stress. And you'll begin to see that Changing your body is so much more than the ABCs, what to eat and not. It's all about how do I change my whole lifestyle. And this is why so many people struggle. And this is why it's just as difficult to lose 5 or 10 kg as it is maybe 20 or 25, because you've still got to make those changes. So the filming's going quite good. I need to be a bit better at the filming, but you'll see it coming up soon. And you'll see how this lady's putting it all together in all aspects of life, not just what to eat, which is, you know, almost everybody isn't following what they think they should be doing anyway. So... Why is that? Well, it's because everything's intertwined to the rest of your life. It's intertwined to your social, it's intertwined to everything, and that's what I want to get across. So I'm looking forward to getting that filming action out. Let's get into some questions. It's been ages, but I've got to keep it short as I'm off to the library to write in a bit, but let's go. The first question was an interesting one about doing cheat days. So there's different research on this and there's different models for getting in shape. So a flat model would be you set a food intake. Now, whether you're counting calories or not is a different question. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But you're doing the same every day. So Monday, whatever, 1,800 calories, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It's a nice method. There's no right or wrong. It's always behavioral. The opposite side of this, which is more classic thing in more bodybuilders' world, is six days of dieting, one day off. There's merits to this too. With most of my normal people, the average guy from the street, I normally use a five and two method where I want them to get five days good, two days where they can be more relaxed and so forth. Everyone wants to know what's the magic formula. There is no magic formula. Now, the research is quite negative against cheat days. It's not that good as you would think it was. One of the problems with cheat days is it teaches you how to binge eat. So if you do six good dieting days and that seventh day, you have to eat quite a lot of food. And if you don't eat quite a lot of food, you won't be able to go really hard on the six days. So if you've sort of already got a tendency to binge eating, it's maybe not the best methodology to do. Five and two, it doesn't quite promote that huge binge, yet also gives people freedom. The flat pack model, where you just do literally seven days all the same, all the same, pros and cons to that too. What if you mess up Thursday? Can you counteract it? But then it doesn't promote the big heavy days of eating food. So there's definitely rights or wrong. So my experience is, annoying as always is in health and fitness, is that there is no right or wrong whether you should do a cheat day or not. Six and one, you really got to know what you're doing because... Like I say, you've got to eat a lot of food on that off day and that can be a good or a bad thing. I've used that for my competitions. I'm on a cheat day today. I've used it quite powerfully. But I know it's very awful for a lot of people. So it's trying to get to that, that delicate balance of what's going on in that respect. Now, big thing on the conversation of cheat days. As I said, the research is pre four. It does show that it's not as good as you would think it would be using cheat days. But where the research is pretty clear is taking off weeks and off periods. So... Linear dieting, I've talked about it in other videos, is when I bang out 12 weeks straight dieting. I'm getting thinner each week and each week. The long-term results, remember I said on this at the top, all I cared about is long-term results. Where are you in five years? That's how I judge my results. So I'm working with you today. I don't care where you are next week. I care about where you are in four years' time. So linear dieting, doing a 12-week crazy body transformation has got quite poor 
long-term maintenance. Doing slower transformation, if I do two weeks on, two weeks off, two weeks on, one week off, has got much, much, some of the best results that we've seen. So cheat days, where does that come into it? Well, it's always about maintenance. Can I stick to something without taking a day off? If I can't, then that's where we've got to get that balance. So there's no right or wrong. So with my people, I get them to experiment. But my general model for an average person in the street, not a fitness competitor, average person in the street, is to try and get five days on target per week and then the other two to be a bit more relaxed. But I've used other models where that's not right for them. I've done six and one. There are other models where we have no off days. The proof is in the pudding of the results. So, But with everybody, what I try and encourage is off weeks. Dieting, not dieting, losing fat, not losing. That is really not a debatable one and very important too. Hello, Mark, how are we doing? Thanks for the message. Um, need to come down Batsy Park. So um, it's beautiful down there at the moment. Obviously, working outside, if you see my you know, social media things, you know it gets cold and wet in the winter occasionally. Now it's obviously perfect, great lifestyle. So that's my cheat day thing. You've got to experiment. I know it's a boring answer, which I give to half these questions, but there is no magic formula. What works for you in that sense? Interesting question. So I've had this from a few people. Why The general thing is, Ben, why the hell can't I get it together? What the hell's going wrong here? There are different things that are going on when you can't get it together. Now, I've had this from like probably three people in the last few weeks. The first lady to ask me though, she couldn't get it together because she had done, just what I touched on the last question, she had done four weeks of good dieting, lost four kg, just over half a stone. She had done pretty good. But I mean, she'd gone unsustainably hard, which I've been warning about the whole time. And if you go unsustainably hard, you don't take the off days, guess what happens? Your body runs into its defense mechanism of trying to stop you losing body fat so quick. So you will begin to lose motivation. Your hunger will increase. Your cravings will increase. Your importance of this goal to your life will decrease. And what happens is it's harder to stick to it. So in this first time this lady asked me it, the reason why she couldn't get it together, really struggling to keep on it, was she just hadn't taken enough time off. And you need to step back for a bit, take a week off. You don't go mental, just eat normally what you need and then come back to it. It was last year when I did, what, seven weeks dieting, losing body fat, lost five kg, took a month. I got to the end of the seven weeks, lost five kg, you know, pure fat, not fake weight. And I was like, no, I just need a break. Four weeks later, came back, did it again. Seven weeks, lost another five kg. You've got to sometimes listen to your body. I think it's the most crazy thing. I see people after people think because you've decided to get in shape today, you can somehow outwit physiology. Don't think people understand how powerful your body is in keeping you alive. Our most primal probably drive is keeping you alive, survival against famine. It's what we've battled is for our whole history of humanity until the last X years where we've now got way too much food and that's the problem. So the point is, if you lost 7% body fat in, well, so 8% in two months, 8, 1% a week, well, you, that is one spectacular body transformation. But think how the body's working. So I've lost 8% in eight weeks, fine. What if you lost 16% in four months? Well, now you've lost a heck of a lot. And what if you've lost 24% in six months? You're probably dead. So it's not that stupid that the body tries to protect against things. So this first lady said, why the hell can't I get it together? She was at the end of a good dieting process. So she just needed time off and then come back to it and you'll have it all your stuff back. Now, of course, if most people aren't asking that question from that state. Most people are saying, well, Ben, look, I'm just a total mess right now. I can't get it back together. What the hell can I do to get going? Well, first thing you gotta look at is, the main reason there, four main reasons. One, there's just way too much stress and emotion going on. That's real life. So the question would then be, what can you do to pull down that stress and emotion in some sort of way? It could be you need to turn your phone off for a day. It could be you need to go to a meditation yoga class for a few hours. If you followed me, obviously I use emotional freedom technique. So I would say, just lock yourself in a room, do this for an hour, see what comes back to change that emotional state. Because that's what's sort of playing on our mind in that respect. Next thing is the plan you've got to look at, because if you're in a really out of control and you can't do anything, you won't be able to go back to your plan A. And this is what I'm talking the whole time. I'm like, the person who turns up to see me, I don't care about that person. I care about that alter ego. The one, you know, I see the motivated person, the sensible one who talks to me. Hi, Ben. Yeah, I really want to get in shape. There's another side of them, another side to you, another side to me. The one that doesn't give a damn, the one who just wants to sit there all day and eat, the one who never does want to get off his ass. That is part of you. And this is what comes back to said before, like these really driven fitness drives. They don't address that negative side of you, the lazy side of you. What they do is they just say, go and just hide out in a cave for a couple of months. And then your negative self, the demotivated self is hiding 
waiting to come back. So for me, when I work with people, I want to get that one up and center so we can work on in that time. So the point being is, if you're in the place right now and you're like, I can't get out of this, what the hell, I just can't get together. What's happening is, your negative self is just dominating the situation. So the only way to move out of this is to edge. So basically, you have to say, what is the lowest level thing that you're prepared to do? So it could be, to be honest, man, I'm going to eat chocolate all day today and watch telly. And I'll be like, right, could you, would you be open, open to having a bit of protein before you start your chocolate binge? Could you have a green juice to have a, before your chocolate binge? Would you be prepared to do a two, literally two minutes on the row where that's hiding out the back of your house? Those things that sound so stupid that it's called edging. So basically, once you do your green juice and then you go and eat all your chocolate, the next day when we ask that same question, you might be prepared to do a green juice and some protein or something. Or you might be prepared to go for a walk before you do that. Or you might be able to say, I'll tell you what, I'll just cut off my ninth chocolate bar. I mean, literally, this is, you know, basement conversations. It's not like, what's my perfect plan of action? Where's your broccoli and tuna? You know, you can never get anywhere close to that when you're in a demotivated state. So the plan is wrong. So if I'm really in a state where I can't get out of it, I'd be like, right, okay, look. Let me get my stress down somehow. That could be problem solving. could be planning out what's going on. It could be talking to somebody about the issue that's going on. It could be emotional techniques, freedom techniques. It could be dance therapy. Something that goes after your stress and emotions so that you're in a better place. So you're not up here all wired. You're down here. You look at the plan of action that you're trying to go to. So if you're trying to go back to your most motivated, successful body transformation plan, stop it. You ain't going to get there when you're in that demotivated state. Only the motivated you can follow that. So the, the idea is to try and edge the other one back. So you just see where you're at, what are you okay to do, and do it, and then build up from there. Then the next element is the motivation side of things. Now, this obviously links into stress. As the problem with health and fitness is it's not that important to your body, to your body, to your life. It's justifiably not that important to your life. So what does that mean? It is actually absolutely essential to every single area of your life, but you can justify it that it's not that important. Because right now I've got this huge work project on, that's more important. I've got this uni project, exams, that's more important. The kids, there's one ill, there's one crying, that's more important. So it's easy for you to really sort of say, this goal's not important, I'll address it in two months' time. That can be a definite problem. So you have to try and retouch into the importance of it. Now, what I always try and do with somebody, remember, for long-term changes, I can't just have you doing health and fitness behaviours just to get in shape, because exactly this happens. God, it's really important to be in shape today. Then you've got two kids, three kids crying. Oh, it's not important anymore. I just got to shut these things up. You know, that's what happens. But when you can link getting in shape or doing the behaviors of getting in shape to being happier, to being a better parent, being a better businessman, being a better whatever it is that's important in your life, then that's the real important changes that we have to come to. So if you're struggling with motivation because you can't get out of it right now, you reduce your stress, you look at the lowest common denominator, and then... You say, right, how will this health and fitness help me in the area that's important right now, which could just be feeling less stress. It won't be a very aesthetic goal of trying to look thin in my bikini for most people because, as I said, when stress hits, life gets busy, that goal comes from here, comes straight back down. But feeling happy, feeling good, feeling stress-free should will always be up there. And I think that's the area to try and get to and look at when you can't get out of this sort of big lull. And then as you begin to edge back into place that more motivational side of you will begin to appear and then you'll be prepared to do more and more. And it's funny how quickly... It, the problem with it is you feel invincible. When you're on the plan, I feel invincible. Come and get me. Then when you're in a total, I can't get it together, you're like, I'll never get back onto it. My life's lost. But it doesn't take that long to go from either way. It just takes a bit of edging and so forth. So that's what you got to do. So that answers the question, why can't you get it together? If you've lost loads of body fat recently and you can't get it together, it's because you need to take time off. If you haven't lost lots of body fat recently... It's because you have got too much stress, the goal's not important enough, so you need to try and re-instigate that, and or you're trying to go to a plan of action that you're never going to follow because it's too hard. It's designed for your motivated self. Your lower motivational state will only do easy stuff, and you've just got to pick the lowest fruit and just go after it. So, what else we got here? How do you do fitness in no time? That's... Before I answer that question, I've had a few people, lots of people ask me that all the time. Before I answer that question... I always just articulate what do they mean by fitness because they're, fitness and getting in shape are interchangeable these day and age. So they say, oh, I need to get fit, I need to do my exercise. I'm like, why? If you're exercising and get fitter, like you care about your 5K running time, we're talking the same thing. If you're actually asking me how do I get in shape and keep losing body fat, you don't have to make time for exercise. It's a bit, personal trainers don't like to admit this because it sort of ruins their business, but you can get results just by controlling your food intake. 
on literally no movement. But your food has to be amazing. So it's unlikely most people can have a normal life and pull that off. So, but on movement levels, you can still move quite a bit, even just through walking, get your food controlled and lose body fat. Fitness, now there's definite benefits to doing exercise, mostly in the health category and definitely in the mood, emotions and so forth. So you should definitely do it. But when you say, how do I do, how do I get fit? I've got no time. If your main goal is body fat, you can get there through food. You don't need to create any more time. You just need to edit that food intake. If you are trying to get fit, people have got this huge misconception of what fitness is related to. It's related to intensity. It's not related to volume. So if you, and I remember once a few years ago, I just did one run a week, 10 minutes, that's all, or 10 to 15 minutes, because I was doing roughly 3K. And I got fitter much, much faster. I think I took my 3K time from 13.45, and obviously out of shape for me at that time, down to back down to 12 minutes in eight weeks, doing one run a week. It shows what you can do just on getting something done regularly. And this is the key to exercise is consistency. So if you are short of time, I'm telling you, you can maintain your fitness on half an hour a week. Literally, if you did a five, 10 minute run, five minutes, well, not stretch so much, five minute warm down from the run, 15 minutes weights, you'll be able to literally come through a one to two months period, roughly the same sort of levels that you went in. Now you're not gonna make gains on that of massive proportions, but that's not hard to do five minutes a week on a run. And this is what people get it wrong. It gets confused with marathon running. If you want to run a marathon, yeah, you're going to have to put in some big two, three-hour sessions. If you just want to stay fit, get the benefits, it's not that hard. Well, all The only way you can really lose your abilities is if you uh, literally do nothing for a month or two, you'll lose stuff. So how do we get fitter was the question. You just need to do some short, intense sessions once, twice a week. Now, the easy thing for a busy, say a busy office worker, is just do it on Saturday and Sunday. Literally a half hour, high quality work, so not volume, high quality work. You can make gains on two, 40, half an hour, 45 minute sessions, Saturday, Sunday, you can make gains. Now, of course, when you realize you can do a 20, 30 minute session, maybe a Wednesday night one or Tuesday before work or a quick lunchtime session on a Thursday could keep these sort of things going. But it's so simple, you know, obviously, traveled a lot around the world some places you literally dodgy places you don't know where you're at central america whatever a bit risky you can go literally a run five minutes left of the hotel door five minutes back i've done a 10 minute run you know that's so easy to do and it keeps your fitness ticking over and you do a few push-ups in the room you do a few whatever shoulder sands you do some squat jumps you can keep your fitness very easy so fitness is not that hard you know now for general fitness i mean you can just interlink it to what you're doing in life it's not that hard at all so that's what I say, just focus on intensity. And when I say intensity, you don't have to kill yourself, you just have to do it. Because the key to ultimate fitness gains is consistency. So if you said, Ben, I want to become a runner, and I'll just say, well, if you can do 100 runs between now and this time next year, that's two a week, I know you're going to be a, an absolute animal compared to where you are today as far as running goes. And it doesn't matter if runs 13 was dreadful, 26 to 28 was horrendous. It's just about getting them done. And you don't need that much time to get it done. You just need to do it. That's on a fitness front. But remember, when most people ask me that question, how do I do the fitness? It's under the sub, what's the word, text, that that's the only way they can get in shape. That's not true. The way to get in shape is to manipulate your food to match what you're moving. So the fitness is not necessary. Obviously, if, you need, if your gains are muscle gains now, and that's your goal, then yeah, that's undeniable. You've got to get to the gym. But still, it comes down to intensity. You don't have to do six hours a week. You can go hard, short, 30 minutes, twice a week, three times, four times, depending where your muscle levels are at at the moment hopefully that answers that so a few questions about how to count calories and the liquid element of calories where does that come into it so without getting into a huge debate of calorie counting if you don't know what's in food you're going to struggle to get in shape it's as simple as that getting in shape is ultimately down to energy balance to some level there are some you know little caveats to it but let's not lie about it if you don't know what you're eating it's gonna be very hard for you to get in shape so while calorie count in the long term has shown to be pretty disastrous, people are so out. It's unbelievable. That study came out recently where people thought they were eating 2,000 calories a day. Sounds okay. They were actually eating 4,000 calories a day. You know, that's an absolute joke. You know, that's ridiculous. So that's long-term calories. But short-term, that is literally Tuesday, I'm going to see how much food I eat. It's very easy to do it. So the actual methodology of how would you do that, simplest. You download an app of some sort. Then you see what you're eating. Now, if you're eating things on packages it's very easy you can just scan them on your phone beep and all of a sudden it tell you exactly what you're eating do that all day and you know what's going on and because you're just doing it for one or two days you can be quite anal about making sure you remember everything you eat long term you get busy and so forth 
if you're more somebody who makes food at home and stuff like that, you'll just need to weigh it. So how do you weigh it? You need an electronic scale. You put your plate on it, you dump your thing on your plate, or you do it the other way around. You put the container with the food on it, you take it out, and then it should tell you how much you're eating in that sense. Yes, it can be annoying with like a lot of different vegetables, but just I would count all vegetables the same, and it's not that hard to do. But you literally do that one or two times, three, four times, you become aware of roughly what you're eating. And then you say, is this a good or a bad day for me? You go, well, this is probably quite a good day. Well, let me serve a, survey a bad day. And obviously nobody wants to survey a bad day because they're like, oh God, what might happen? But that's what we need. You can see a typical good day, see a typical bad day. You could roughly work out what the heck's going on. And what most people find out is, gee, they're just eating too much food. And that's because society just hasn't got bigger by mistake. It's because food's gone up, movement's gone down a little bit, but that's, that's debatable. Um, so that's what you've got to do. So the logistics of how to count calories is just that. You either scan the thing on your app or you put it, write it down in little notes thing on your phone or in a book. You've got to weigh the food. If it's not a packaged food, you've got to weigh it and then you should have your data and it's not that hard to do. Now, if you are drinking, so this was a question that I got, one of my guys, you know, do I, how do I count beer? Well, you literally go on your app, you put it down, had six pints of beers, how many calories in a pint? 250, 1500, and you begin to see the influence of drinks because people think now, we're really messed up now. People think there's a set down meal. I've sat down with a knife and fork. That counts as a meal. And then you look at their snacks. They've had more calories in their snacks than their meal. So you're like, well, your snack is not a snack. Your snack is actually a meal and your meal's a snack. They can drink, you know, like significant quantities of calories by drinking it. It's all food. If the body digests it and turns it into energy, it's food. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter whether it's a sit down meal, whether it's a quick snack on the run. It all counts. So I really advise people to do a couple of days just to see what the heck's going in the mouth. It can be absolutely life-changing. And obviously, I'd say the same to movement, but that's easy. Steps and stuff are done on your phone, but that's another question we'll answer another day. How do I measure body fat? I've had this for a fair few people, or measure progress. Clothes. For me, it's clothes, clothes, clothes. Specific items of clothes. Pick out something that's your end goal and try it on every week. Then a lot, if your end goal's miles off, then the first time you try it on, of course, you might not get the trousers above your knees, for example. That's fine. But pick out a goal outfit that measures the whole body. So something on the lower body to the upper body. So that could be a dress for a woman. It could be a shirt and tie, trousers and tie for a guy. Something that shows the whole body as an end goal. And I try that on every week. Then I would try on something intermediate that I could also measure. So say my goal is to be dress size 12 and I'm dress size 18 today. Then I try on my dress size 12 once a week, every Monday morning perhaps. At the same time, I maybe try on my dress size 14 and a 16. But what I'm saying is specific, specific items of clothing, not general stuff. And I would base all my evaluations off those clothes. Now, can you still jump on the weighing scales? Yes, you can. Can you use, say, a body fat measure, one of the electronic scales? You can. But there, every other method, probably including clothes, has a pro and a con to it. The electronic scales, unless you've got one of the really, you know, thousand pounds expensive machines, which you won't, are pretty crazy with some of their results. They're not that accurate because they're related to hydration or maybe not, not accurate. They can give you some very erroneous results, which you can then ruin your mood and think. Weight, some people are not very linear with weight. So it goes down a bit, stays, goes down, down, up, down. Some people aren't great with that. So that's that you can use, obviously with my clients, I can measure their caliper thing, but I make mistakes, you know, I'm not perfect. So factors are in it. So the idea is you want a battery of tests, but the best way to measure progress, measure body fat, is through a specific item of clothing you try on, same time every week to see progress to come along. Then you can take the other battery of methods and then you just review, well, my weight's the same, but my body fat percentage was down, my clothes are looser. What does that mean? Well, it probably means I'm down. People say I'm looking at, you get the vibe in that sense. So that's still the best way for me. I know a lot of people go all this scientific, you pay for the DEXA scan for 80 pounds. Unless you're like a competing body athlete, even then I don't think you need it. It's all just for fun in that sort of sense. If you want to put your money on that. What we got here. Uh, uh, uh. So obviously, some people who know my rugby website, um, it's off season in rugby time. So I've got a website, a website for rugby players. My first book was on rugby training. So a couple of questions around that, which may apply to non-rugby players. How do I get stronger in a squat? That was a question. I had one guy last summer, two summers ago, added 37 kilograms to his squat. And they wanted to know what was going on. Well, in that particular case, and this is a play for most people, before you can get strong in a squat, you've got to get rid of what's making you weak. And for a lot of people, they're not flexible enough to do a squat and they've got imbalances. So the way the body works is if your joints are slightly twisted, so say a joint should be like this on top of each other, but it's slightly twisted. It's awful. It's not working like this. It should be like this, but it's slightly twisted. That will 
it won't give you an injury. You'll still be able to move around a bit, but it will get the brain to downregulate the strength of the muscle. So as a result, instead of being able to access all 100 kilograms of strength in my bum, if the knee joint is slightly twisted off, then as a result, that's obviously not slightly, that's significantly, but let's call it slightly. Um, the body will say you can't use 100 kilograms of bum, you can only use 70 kilograms. So by resolving some of those issues, especially in the spine, so if you want to get stronger on the squat, one of the problems with the squat is it loads your spine. So if your spine is out of alignment, it's going to accentuate those loads. So the guy who gained 37 kilograms on his squat, what we actually did was restore about 20 kilograms, actually 15 kilograms by sorting out his injuries. So we did that through massage techniques uh, because again, if your joints are slightly twisted, which will give you pain. So if you've got any pain in any joints, your knee hurts, your ankle hurts, your back hurts, you can almost guarantee there's a rotation in the joint that's giving you that pain because a highly, a well aligned joint is very unlikely to be in pain. You've got to get rid of those. You can do that through massage methods, whether that's using a foam roller, a lacrosse ball, or physical masseuse themselves. I always touch it. I was on the gym yesterday moaning about it. If you're, if you're using a foam roller and you're rolling up and down on it, you're doing it wrong, send me a message and I'll tell you how to do it. You know, when I was around when the foam rollers first came out, like 16 years ago or something like that, and they taught you how to do it, it's a trigger point device. It's not a massage device. So you can't run up and down. Slightly sidetracked. So the point was, you want to get strong in your squat. You've got to resolve your little imbalances so that you've got no injuries on it. You've got to be flexible enough so you can actually do a squat. It's a very challenging exercise for flexibility terms. And then you've got to do strength training. So obviously most people who are playing rugby are already doing weights. So strength training for weight training is doing less than five reps. So I literally get the bar, do one, two, three, put it back. Take a bit of a rest, do it again. That is what strength training is. Now, if you've never done weights before, don't go in the gym and do that, it's unwise. Go in the gym and start on 15 reps after a month, come down to 10 reps, because you've got to prepare your ligaments to get up to speed. But if you're a regular weightlifter, in that exercise, if you've not been doing squats for two months, six months, you've got to start off at high reps. Don't come in thinking just because you've been doing bench press every week, you're ready for squats. Then you've got to do low reps. The body does not respond. The body goes crazy if you do low reps on strength. If you do two, three reps, you don't build massive amount of muscle most of the changes are up here neurologically, the brain learning how to coordinate muscles and activate what it's got. That's how you get stronger. So sort out your injuries, increase your flexibility so the squat is safe for you and then load it heavy relative for you to get those results. So that's how to get your squat up and that's how the guy did 37 kilograms. And obviously I'm getting lots of rugby questions because it's off season now. If you are a rugby player, this is the time to make your changes. This is the time to make your gains. Rugby is like a martial art. You cannot play at a higher level unless you're bigger, stronger and faster than the guy at the next level up. So this is what you've got to do. So, and obviously if you're a normal fitness person, the answer to that squat thing is exactly the same. You want to squat more, you've got to get rid of your imbalances. You've got to sort out the joint angles because your knees will hurt if they're out of alignment. You've got to then make sure you're flexible enough to safely do it. And then you just load that up and make the muscles work as hard as they can and you will get stronger. To relate back exactly to my last question, if... <laughs> When you say I want to get strong, I want to squat, what do you actually mean? Most people mean they just want to have a more toned size or more toned bum or they want to lose body fat and squats are the methodology to get there. That comes back to basics. If you want to build muscle, strength training on squats is probably not the best way to go. It could become part of a long-term cycle, which you would have probably seen in articles, but no, it's about if I want to build muscle and be toned, you want to get a lot of burn in those muscles. Can I burn those muscles so it hurts? This is where in a bodybuilding sense, the no pain, no gain thing came from because if, assuming it's in your muscle, you want to burn up the muscle you're trying to grow and it'll hurt and you'll get the best results in that sort of sense. If it's in a body fat sense, I touched on this two questions back, you do not need any exercise to lose body fat. It comes back to your food intake that you've got to mediate to it. Now, should you do exercise for fun and the health benefits and also there is an influence to getting results, but it's not 100% necessary to do it, then yeah, but that's the question on squats. So, Really, again, ask yourself a motivation for how wanting to get stronger on a squat. If you have a better body, you don't necessarily need to focus on that. If it is purely that, you've got to do low reps. For example, the rugby player who asked me that question. Last couple. Again, this is another rugby one. How do you get faster on the rugby field? This comes back to sprint training. So, sprints is quite has four main elements. Let's put it that way. The most important, probably is technique. People's running technique is horrendous. And if you see my rugby YouTube channel, I've got sprint analysis and so forth on there. If you're like putting your foot in front of your center of gravity too much, every single stride you're sprinting, you are slowing yourself down. So you can come stronger and you'll still keep slowing yourself down. So the first thing in, if you want to get quick on a rugby field, is to work on your sprint technique. It's got to be done. 
Um, then alongside that, you've got to do jumps and plyometrics. So it's a springy event, bounce, bounce, bounce. So if you're not doing plyometrics and agility work, because for rugby players watching this, rugby is a multi-directional sport. It's basically a diagonal running sport. So you can hang it straighter in a, quicker in a straight line, but it doesn't necessarily mean you'll be quicker against the guy who you go one-on-one -on -one with if he's actually quicker than you on a diagonal sprint. So you need to do agility work, sprint technique work, and there's technique on agility too. Technique's the base, then you need to do jumps of some kind. If you're not doing jumps, it's very hard to get quicker because it's a bouncy event, plyometrics. Then the next element to it is you need to look at your strength versus your weight. So strength will just be pure strength training, like that was the point of that guy who did the 37 kilogram gain in the squat, who wanted to get quicker. You've got to lift heavy weights. All those sprinters, the pro sprinters are so strong, it's unbelievable. And the other side of that coin is lose excess weight. You know, um, any the sprinting guys, you know, Usain Bolt was only 13 stone, he's what, six foot five. If a rugby player is six foot five, big, muscly looking, he's probably gonna be packing in 17 stone. So sprinters are naturally quite light people, but they're strong too. So again, if you are a good player watching this and you want to be quicker next thing, and this is what I do with props and so forth all the time, it's like you don't need to add another five kilograms to your squat. You don't need to add another five kilograms to your leg press. You need to lose a stone and add two minutes, take two minutes off your 3K time and you are like going from division five to division two. It's that sort of thing. And look at top level rugby. Oh, it's scary. Top level rugby is big guys who can run three kilometers in like 11 minutes and you're like, that's impossible. It's not impossible because there's big guys doing that throughout international rugby and that's the sort of thing. So if you are looking to get quicker, it's doing those sort of things, looking at a technique, looking at um, plyometric training, going to get our strength up in the gym and then looking at your body composition. Do you need to lose body fat? If you do, then that's the thing. But we've really got to work on the technique. It always comes back to that because you can get much stronger if you've got bad technique. It just ain't going to cut it. Have I got most of my questions done? Stronger, stronger, stronger. Uh, I think that's most of my questions done. One thing a lot of people keep saying with Sam Barbecue yesterday, people calling me a celebrity fitness trainer. I've never worked with a celebrity. Training isn't about being with celebs. It's about normal people getting normal results. So I don't quite, I know that's what all these things are about. I know I've been on telly and all that, so you get the impression or whatever, but it's not that. It's about normal people doing normal things. And it always comes back to the basics that I always harp on about, and that's what we try and get across. So anyway, if you are watching this, need to get in shape. Don't need to be a celeb to speak to me, huh? So, um, of course, if you are a celeb, well, say hello. Right, any questions ever, message me across. Go on my website. Remember, my newsletter I'm sending out twice a week, three times a week. Get on there and so forth. I'm off to the British Library. Write my book, and I'll keep you updated. Good to be back on.